Pontypool, Wales, home to roughly 30,000 people, two of which were David and Linda Maggs, who lived together at 11 Lansdowne in Sebastopol. The couple had been together since 1988, but had initially met in 1977. Linda had been raising her two children, Kerry and Andrew, on her own after her first marriage had ended. She worked incredibly hard to support herself and her children, sometimes working three jobs to make it happen. David had also been married twice before. They had been together for many years when they decided to marry, and in August of 2002, they tied the knot. Andrew and Kerry had welcomed David into the family, and the couple looked set to begin the rest of their lives together. 74-year-old Linda had an incredibly active social life. She was the member of a dance group and was often out with her group at dance clubs. She also loved being a grandmother and enjoyed going shopping for clothes with her beloved granddaughter. She took real pride in her home and garden, which was often the centre for many social gatherings. Linda was incredibly close to her two children and they shared a tight bond. She was always on hand to help or lend advice whenever needed. Her son Andrew described her as a beautiful, kind lady with a huge heart. Her 71-year-old husband David had worked as an accountant, but would later retire. The pair enjoyed travelling together all over the world, including the United States and Australia. However, there was one thing that was a source of contention for the couple. Money. Prior to the marriage, David had wanted Linda to sign a prenuptial agreement, but she didn't. She said as they were married, everything should be shared between the two of them. However, once they were married, they had separate bank accounts and even paid for their own food if they went out for a meal, something her daughter Kerry thought was odd. David didn't share her busy social life. On the occasions he would go out with Linda to her dance shows and clubs, he wouldn't engage or participate. Instead, he would stand outside the venue and smoke. In 2009, David had become more and more reclusive, as he had had his driver's licence taken away due to having epilepsy. Over the next few years, their marriage continued to decline. They would often argue over money, and neighbours could hear them fighting in the back garden. By March of 2020, their relationship had completely broken down. When coronavirus hit and lockdown orders were issued, David rang his GP and was prescribed sleeping tablets and antidepressants. His sister was concerned for him and said he was failing to look after himself properly. She would often bring him food and check on him. His day-to-day -day life consisted of playing cards, watching films and smoking. He had been in ill health for several years, having survived two heart attacks and spending five months in hospital, as well as suffering from emphysema. Lockdown was also very hard for Linda, having previously enjoyed a busy and active social life, not being able to see anyone meant she spent most days upstairs alone. After his heart attack in 2019, he was referred to a counsellor. He was given an anxiety and depression score of 12, with anything over 8 being grounds for a referral. In August, he requested that his antidepressants were increased, and after this, he said he was feeling much better. But in September 2020, another argument between the pair would do further damage to their already difficult relationship. David had called his sister one night and said they had been arguing again and asked her to go to the house. She said when she got there, it was clear that Linda was very stressed. The argument had once again been about money. Linda had shouted, it's over, it's done. And David had replied, just go, before going back into the house. Three days later, Linda apologised to David's sister for the argument. On the 16th of September 2020, Linda decided to start divorce proceedings and officially end her marriage to David, citing unreasonable behaviour. After consulting a lawyer, she was advised not to leave the home and David would also not move out. So they continued living together, but the pair were living separate lives, with Linda refusing to clean up after him or cook for him. David had the downstairs turned into a bedsit with a lock on his door and Linda had the upstairs. While she had purchased locks for her doors, she was yet to have them fitted. As they shared a bathroom and kitchen, Linda said she felt as though she was being stalked by him. He would often sit outside the bathroom while she was in the shower and wait for her to come out. An estate agent would go and look at the house and value it. He described David as chain-smoking and visibly shaking. David told the estate agent he would rather hurt his wife than lose anything. 
the estate agent described Linda as being very timid. When it became clear that the house could be sold as part of the divorce, in November of 2020, David was put in touch with a housing support worker who encouraged him to look into sheltered accommodation and renting as options for if the house sold. He expressed the same sentiment to the housing officer that he had to the estate agent. Linda was not going to get anything, even if it meant she came to harm. He told the support worker that he needed to go to the police, as he had thought about stabbing Linda. The support worker was so concerned that she spoke to her line manager, who advised her to call the police on the non-emergency number and also contact his doctor. The doctor phoned David that day and increased his sleeping pills and antidepressants. After the support worker had contacted them, the police went to the house to speak to the couple. When David's sister answered the door, she said she was in shock. She said the police explained that they were concerned for David's mental health, a sentiment she shared, saying he was a wreck and very depressed. David said he was surprised that she had contacted the police, but understood why she had. He said he felt the police didn't listen to him and that their visit wasn't worth it. An officer spoke to Linda, saying there were concerns for her safety. The officer said she was quite flippant and thought it was just his way of trying to get her out of the house, as the house was solely in his name. The officer said Linda declined a domestic violence risk assessment and the option of a safe house, saying that David had never laid a finger on her. The officer told her to avoid arguments with him and keep her phone close to her. No further action was taken. By the new year, the pair were no longer speaking. Financial investigators had been brought on board to look into the couple's finances. This meant that the house would likely be put on the market for sale. On the 5th of February 2021, Linda was on the phone to her daughter Kerry. She told Kerry that she was worried about how David would react when he found out their finances were being examined. That same day, David's sister had called him at around 9pm. She said he seemed settled and was enjoying watching a film. The 6th of February, 2021, 9.13am. A disturbing 999 call is made. Thank you. Police emergency, how can I help? Please. Yeah, you touch the police, how can I help? Please. How can I help? I just killed the wife. Please. You just thought, sorry? Please. Oh, yeah, how can I help you? You're through to the police. Is this an emergency? Please. Is this an emergency? Yeah. Yeah, why? I think I just killed a wife. Your wife, is it? Yeah. Okay, what's your address? Are you at home? Yeah. Call, call an ambulance just in case. And an ambulance as well. Okay, so what's happened then between you and your wife today for this to have happened? Did you have an argument? And Just, just, just call an ambulance and, and call the police. Yeah, you're through to the police, that's fine, okay, so I'm putting a log on now and we'll pull the ambulance out as well, okay, but what happened? Oh, I just, I just, I stabbed her. You stabbed her, did you? Yeah. Okay, have you got a knife on you now? Pardon? Have you got a knife on you now? No. Where's your wife? In, in bed. She's led in bed, is she? Yeah. Okay. What's your name? Mags, M A W G S. Is it David I'm speaking to? David, yeah. Hi, David, okay. We're going to be sending help out to you now, okay? Is there a lot of blood or. Yeah. Yeah? Is she speaking to you or do you think she's passed away? I'm passed away, I think. Okay. And what makes you think now? Can you see if she's still breathing or is she talking? I don't know. Or... I don't know, I just, I just lost it. You just lost it? So did you have an argument, did you? I just lost the hug. He just come for me. Just to help me. You are sorry. Just help me. <laughs> we'll send help to you now, okay? That's what you I'm doing for you. I'm going to type this up for you, okay? Oh, God help me. As officers and other emergency services descended on the scene, body cameras captured the moment they went inside the house. As the officer enters, two knives can be seen on the last step of the staircase. Stay where you are! Stay where you are! Who else is here? Who else is here? Right. Okay. This time you are under arrest on suspicion of murder. The time is 26 minutes past nine in the morning. 
You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention, when questioned, something which you later on in court, anything you do say may be given in evidence. Necessity for your arrest at this time is to protect a vulnerable person and prevent any further injury to a person. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Alright, alright. Just try and stay nice and calm for us, okay? All right. You stay nice and calm for us, okay? That's enough of what? She tried to steal two hoses off me. Okay. Two hoses, for God's sake. Okay. She did five months in hospital last year. Okay. What was that for? Hard. Okay. She came to see me three times. The rest of the time, she ransacked the house, got hold of all the paperwork, destroyed all the paperwork, and tried to claim on this house as well. David's coldness was apparent. He told the officers, 30 years I've been married to her and she doesn't know how to keep her mouth shut, so I topped her. As the devastating news broke, the community could not believe what had happened. Flowers were left outside the home and Linda's children were being supported by officers as they faced this horrifying new reality. The truth about what exactly had happened that morning would soon come out. Even though the upstairs was Linda's domain, David had gone up there and taken two large red kitchen knives with him, leaving one outside the bedroom door, and he took the other one into her room at around 9am. As Linda lay in bed under the sheets, her estranged husband walked into her room. David told her he wanted to talk about their separation and impending divorce but she told him that that conversation needed to be left to the lawyers and she wasn't going to discuss it with him. David became enraged. In a frenzied attack, he stabbed her multiple times. Linda, who was four foot ten, had suffered an appalling catalogue of injuries. She had been stabbed 15 times in the neck, head, stomach and chest. Her arms and hands had defensive wounds, showing that she had tried to fight him off with everything she had. She had also sustained two broken ribs. One stab wound to her chest was 15 and a half centimetres. When trying to understand what had led to this, officers learned that David had become consumed with the idea that Linda had been hiding money from him and that she was going to cheat him out of money during the divorce. As was seen in the body cam footage, he told the officers that she had tried to steal two houses from him. Investigations were carried out into the couple's finances to see if there was any evidence of Linda hiding money from him or of her trying to dishonestly get more money in the divorce. They found none. But they did find that David had a savings account with £14,000 in there, something he had failed to declare. He admitted to having killed her but said that he had blacked out and couldn't remember. He told the investigators during his interviews that whilst he had taken the knives upstairs with him, he had only intended to discuss the finances and the divorce. He said he had left one outside the door in case he needed it. He said, She's only four foot ten, but she can be a right madam. The police soon learned about his history of threatening to harm Linda, and soon another witness would come forward with a worrying story to tell. A lady named Pamela had been one of Linda's friends, and then she had become friends with the couple, before a falling out meant she only spoke to David. Pamela had contacted the investigators on the 18th of February and explained that just a few weeks before Linda was killed, she had been on the phone with David and asked him how the divorce process was going. She said he replied, I feel like I could stab her. She said to him that would mean he would go to prison. His response, I don't care. He was remanded in custody. On the 8th of February, he appeared at Newport Crown Court, charged with murder. He entered a plea of guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, adamant that he had blanked out. 
Judge Michael Fritton would preside over the trial at Cardiff Crown Court, which began on the 11th of January, 2022. Judge Fritton told the jury, it's admitted David Maggs killed Linda Maggs, but there is a dispute about the circumstances in which he killed her. There's a dispute about his mental state on the day he killed her, and there's a dispute about his responsibility for killing her. Defence lawyer Sarah Jones argued that Mags's mental health and depression would have clouded his judgement that day. Evidence of his past health clearly points to something very, very wrong with his functioning at the time. I accept it does not excuse what he has done, she said. Psychiatrist Dr Nguyen Gilapathy told the jury, In my opinion, the degree of his impairment due to depression is significant. This is a case where there are clear and significant mental health problems. In my opinion, this is a case of diminished responsibility. But there wasn't a clear medical consensus, as another psychiatrist, Dr Thomas Wynne, said he didn't think David Maggs had depression. The court heard that David felt he had been stung by his two previous ex-wives and was adamant that Linda was not going to get any of his money. The prosecution told the jury that Linda was upset, scared and anxious. She told a friend she didn't know what her husband was capable of. A friend told the court that Linda had explained they had argued when David had changed his will several years prior, cut her out of it completely and decided to leave everything to his son. The witness said, About five years ago they were arguing about the will. She said she had to pick up an iron to defend herself. The witness also said she had spoken to Linda the night before her death and they had talked about the divorce, with Linda saying she thought he would lose his temper but added that he wouldn't hurt her and in any case, she could call the police. The prosecution said that David had given Linda an allowance of £30 a week and told her, no sex, no marriage, no nothing meaning financially she would be solely reliant on her pension to get by. It was argued that David would become verbally abusive towards Linda and would insult her, calling her thick and stupid. Other key witnesses would address the court, the estate agent and housing officer who had witnessed David's behaviour and heard him make threats towards her life. This painted a very different image from the frail man who was wheelchair-bound and struggled to get in and out of the prison van. David's sister also testified about the argument the couple had had in the garden in September of 2020, saying that Linda had been the one to lose her temper and that she had never seen her brother use threats of violence until that altercation. The prosecution lawyer called Linda's death a vicious and repeated attack. The 999 call and police body cam footage were also shown to the jury, painting a vivid image of the chain of events that had transpired that day. It was also noted that he had only said he had blanked out when he had been reminded that he was under caution and anything he said could be used in court. After a day and a half of deliberations, the jury had reached their verdict on February 1st, 2022. The jury rejected his defence of diminished responsibility and he was found guilty of the murder of his wife. On the 17th of March... 71-year-old David Maggs was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 20 years that he must serve behind bars. His defence lawyer Sarah Jones said that due to his health and age, however long his sentence was, he would likely die in prison. She said he had asked her to tell the court how sorry he was and that he wished it had never happened. When sentencing him, Judge Michael Fritton called David a self-centred, self-interested, bitter and unpleasant man. You had come to resent Linda in a whole variety of ways. You resented her still having a life, a social life, female friends, loving members of family. You resented her having the courage to stick up for herself and start divorce proceedings against you. I don't think you care about anyone other than yourself, he said. During the sentencing hearing, Linda's son Andrew gave a victim impact statement. You claim you can't remember anything, but I don't believe you. When you do remember, I hope it torments you as it torments us. On your wedding day, I made a speech and welcomed you into the family. I wish I had never, ever said those words. Throughout this whole process, you have not shown a single ounce of remorse, regret or compassion. That does not surprise me. Mum always said you would never, ever say sorry. Andrew also added that Linda's headstone used her maiden name of Minahan and not her married name of Mags. 
in half of all of them, we went to basically find all of the great police officers that have been involved in the investigation. We would also like to thank all the witnesses that gave evidence in court, members of the jury, and returned a guilty verdict. Without all your hard work, dedication, support, and understanding, you will never have got the justice for a lovely man. For Linda's heartbroken loved ones, being denied the chance to say goodbye was devastating. Having such a kind and devoted woman ripped away from them in the most horrendous of circumstances has left a void that will never be filled. Linda's memory will continue to live on through those who knew and loved her, and she will always be remembered as a devoted mother, grandmother and friend. For those of you that like to listen on the go, we now have our episodes in podcast form and you can now find this via the link in our description box or by searching Truly Criminal Podcast on your podcasting platforms.